Matt, how, how are you? How are you coping? I'm I'm coping all right. I feel really energised. Yes, I mean you know it, I it's... haven't felt the need to take up like the Guardian's offer of counselling for for no, journalists I, 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 who are too browbeaten. I, I, I haven't needed any um, special counselling. No, um, which is which is nice. You know, it's nice when there's a week when one can say that. Yeah, I mean um, for clarity, uh, I'm not under any illusions about how awful the news. Oh has no, been, no, 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 no. But, but I mean, I'm up for the fight. Also, you know, it, it's nice to know what one has to do. Yes, you exactly. Know, the, 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 that that's clarity is better than hope and and we and the topic of this podcast is going to be about some of the clarity that has yes. dawned on us in the last so, so hours just to get us in the mood as if we weren't already let's have a quick and possibly uh, final uh, blast of um, joe biden still president of the united states folks mm. um commenting on the election you know the struggle for the soul of america since our very founding has always been an ongoing debate and still vital today. I know for some people, it's a time for victory, to state the obvious. For others, it's a time of loss. Campaigns are contests of competing visions. The country chooses one or the other. We accept the choice the country made. I've said many times, you can't love your country only when you win. You can't love your neighbor only when you agree. Something I hope we can do, uh, no matter who you voted for, is see each other not as adversaries, but as fellow Americans. Bring down the temperature. So, mm. that's... Um that's nice. And uh, it, it was a little pointed him saying, you know, we're going to do a peaceful transfer of authority. Mm. You know, we're not going to storm the Capitol. Yeah. Um, yeah. Be nice to one another um, yeah. before he goes wherever he's. It was a bit like thought for the day, really, wasn't it? It, it, it was a bit like yeah. thought for the day, but he was uh, he seemed uncommonly pleased, which is odd. It's as if he was. Pit of him was quite pleased at the result. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very well, nasty. That's not, but but also it does play to his his last remaining strength in in his own yes. head, which is of like a fatherly figure. Right. It's like I mean, come it, on, kids, calm it down. It, you know? He wants to exit the stage in yeah. a in a dignified fashion. He's going to have lunch with Trump, uh, yeah. which one would just love to be a fly on the It'd wall. Be amazing. <laughs> but I suspect. I suspect it'll be a very aim because we oh, know that Trump can do charm. Uh, and he know? he mentioned in a, in one of the interviews he's done since the election that he's had very civil, yeah, polite uh, conversations with uh, Kamala Harris and and Biden. So you know that that's that's where we are. Well, let's let's face it; they've got no choice. I mean, because there's there's, there's nothing to argue about. There's, there's there's no no room for argument. There's yeah. no no suggestion of. Um, uh, I mean, there wasn't actually last time, but there was. There's no real plausible su suggestion of any um, interference in the election, um, and so on we go. And he's stormed out the traps. Trump. Uh, we're recording this Friday and um, Friday morning, and overnight we've learned that he's appointed his chief of staff, Susie Wiles, who was co-campaign manager. And the point really to make is that. Um, this is the first of what will carry on, which is he's appointing loyalists. Yeah, we, well, he, this is the woman that he he dragged up on stage. That's at right. Speech who didn't want to be there. It was no. very very shy. She said, we call her the Ice Maiden. We call her the Ice Maiden, and she is. A, I mean, she's a very very seasoned Republican operative. She uh, worked for the Reagan campaign. She worked for Jack Kemp, who everyone's forgotten, but was um, vice presidential nominee with Bob Dole in '96. Good God, uh, that she feels she like would, ancient history. She's worked it? for Trump, uh, and then she went off and worked for. Uh, DeSantis in Florida for a while they fell out she went back to Trump she's family I mean she knows Trump's family very well she also knows JD Vance's family very well so she what this sends a signal is a um I'm keeping the home team and b I'm you know it's loyalists from yeah. now on in Justin Webb said a very interesting thing on the Today program as I was coming in he said uh he was describing a photograph of the Trump family uh, and it had Elon Musk in it as well, who is now part of the family as well. Very much. And then he said, uh, and it looks like a family, uh, you know, a picture of the Trump family Christmas card kind of thing, or should I say the Trump dynasty? And that, I think, hit, uh, a, it, hit a, a, no, it a, a key point that we are talking about a man who is arranging a dynastic 
movement. I mean, around, we are we so. are about we're about to watch um, the the the, um, the 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 previously unmade episode of geopolitical succession. Yeah, you know, Jesse Armstrong right, it right. returns. I mean, this yeah. is and and I think part of the story of of this term, amongst many others, will be the jostling for position as to who is the successor. Because of course, Trump has to unless he goes full, you know, mm. autocrat uh, has to step down at the end of this yes. term. Yeah, and just to clarify that point, because I had to Google it, because I wondered whether there was a sort of no. small print saying if there was a gap, no. could you have another two? And there no, isn't. You, 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 it's absolutely only, yeah. only two. Yeah. So um, this was after Roosevelt served about 19 terms. So <laughs> That was astonishing. That, yes, it was. I mean, because, I mean, the, the, in my Googling, I found the, the history of it, and it was up until relatively recently, it was convention, wasn't it? It was yes. just... We'll take what George Washington said about leaving the stage after yeah, two terms. But not necessarily everyone did. And, and then Franklin D. Roosevelt, hailed today as one of the great yeah, presidents said, of our staying. times, just stayed on for Until four, he died. Stayed on for four elections. Until such yeah. time as he ceased to be. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and even then, Until he even was then he wasn't quite sure. FDR. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, look, I mean, what what I mean, we were just saying before we started re recording that what what secret is this is going to be the story for a long time to come and the, there are so many things one can uh fasten upon uh, and i think one of the things that we've been talking about a bit is you know the the, the lessons of this co contest um not the hand wringing but you know what what did the progressives what have the pro progressives done wrong mm that's useful to think about in a sort of more general sense. And I think that it's funny because when I went to New York in March, um, I, I there was something that I saw a lot of anecdotally, uh, but I didn't think it was really worth reporting because I, I'm very conscious that anecdotes, uh, you know, the plural of anecdote is not data, right? That's right, yeah. So I thought, well, just leave it. But actually it, it now strikes a chord. And, and, and the phenomenon was this, which was that a lot of, really very liberal men I was talking to were saying in private, you know, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm thinking about Trump and I would say, oh, come on, you know, and they'd say, well, you know, I'm just so fed up of being scolded mm. and being told I'm wrong about everything. Yeah. And I don't recognize the Democrat Party anymore. And it's all about identity and it doesn't seem to be about class and making people's lives better which in some senses is is a bit unfair to joe biden but nonetheless this is just a perception yes and it, it's interesting because this this all goes back to identity politics which had its big surge in 2017 to 20 i.e I, the, the progressive way of understanding the world was through identity groups um, and then in many ways, I mean, this just, is just spill that out a little bit more. OK, for the well, listeners. you know, so so um, how do we understand ourselves in the political world? Well, traditionally, we've understood each other. Class class analysis was one. But in America, pr predominantly individualism mm -hmm. and identity politics uh, says, no, your, your, your primary uh, form of definition is your race or your gender, or your sex um, or a combination of all, all, all of the above. And a lot of it, and this is, a, I think, such an important point to make, was this this sort of big high season, um, the great awakening, as it was called by some, uh, was legitimate, which was Black Lives Matter, Me Too, you know, were, were legitimate reproaches to the failures of the liberal legal and procedural system. They were groups saying, you know, we've tried it your way and it hasn't worked. Yeah. And I think there was some there was some sort of granular policy messages to be taken out of that. But what what went wrong was that it it, it became a sort of culture of scolding and cancelling and speech codes. And this was a gift to to Trump on him. Yeah. There were many gifts on the road back because it enabled him to speak to that side of america that was fed up of this yeah. and w one of them i mean one of the s most salient sort of statistics that's emerged so far is that he made progress in every demographic group yeah astonishing yeah. people didn't pe you know for example he made very big progress amongst latino voters right 
And the identity politics um, thing was to call them Latinx, Latinx with an X, right? Because that meant that you didn't have to give them a gender. What, really? Yes, Latinx, right? Latinx, oh, I, I right? I see, I see. Instead and, of Latinas, Latinos. Or Latinos, yeah, right. Okay, and, right. And Latino people hated this. Yeah. Because yeah. they were, well, where is this? We didn't, yeah. we didn't ask for this. Who's, yeah. you know, and this sense of white middle class university folk telling um, groups yeah. of one kind or another what was good for them yeah. and scolding everyone else for not doing what they said. And this enabled yeah. Trump to write, I mean, this was one of the, 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 uh, the, the least attractive, but I fear most effective um, ads he ran, and he threw a lot of money at it, which was he ran uh, uh, the, the very short ads, which had Kamala Harris saying, um, yes, I would uh, um, approve of uh, the taxpayer paying for uh, gender reassignment surgery for prisoners. And then the, the, the slogan at the end was, Kamala stands up for they, them. Donald Trump stands up for you. Now, that's undoubtedly transphobic and unpleasant. But yeah. nonetheless, yeah. it didn't come out of nothing. Yeah. yeah, It came out of an America where people were, rightly or wrongly, associating the Democratic Party with this rather superior, condescending, uh, form of politics yeah. and I thought another bad day in that respect was the day that Harris announced a plan for black male voters they were very worried and with some cause about black male voters coming out to vote for them and she used a sort of bullet point plan which included legalizing marijuana mm. now imagine <laughs> You know, free, I can't free cannabis caps. Right, I, I can't speak for black male voters, but let me yeah. take a stab. Right, <laughs> that if you're, you know, the idea that you as a black man, a black citizen of the That's, United States, paying your taxes, going about you yeah. know your normal life, that you're told by the presidential candidate, hey, <laughs> if you vote Democrat, <laughs> we'll legalize weed. I mean, so so this is what I think defines you: is yeah. your desire to smoke weed. Yeah, yeah. and 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 I think that that. That form of politics, yeah. I mean, I think that's why I preface my remark by saying that there, 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 are, there are legitimate bits to it, you know, which we shouldn't ditch um, either side of the Atlantic. Of course. And yeah. David Lammy is very good on this, you yeah. know, that, that, we, 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 that we, should, we shouldn't just think of it in terms of slogans and Instagram posts and virtue signaling and speech codes, you know. But I think that, in, that one, of the, one of the many factors in this election was, was a kind of weariness with being told what to do. And of course, there you have this orange maniac, the Lord of Misrule, yeah. saying, do what you want to do. The way, the way I see it is that you're absolutely right about this focus on, or, or, the, or the misdirected focus on these groups that have a very valid case for putting their hands up and saying, absolutely, we, we want equality yeah. across these Areas. But the thing that that was missed, and it was in that very good article by David Brooks in the New York Times that you sent to me, was this: what what they missed. And and by the way, I'm beginning to loathe the word progressives mm. because it it sounds so fucking patronising. Yes, I just you can't know. think of a better one. I though. know, but it's it's like, um, but also it, it sort of implies that. That progress is our domain. We define we progress. We'll tell you what yes. progress is. Yes. When Whereas, you know, more than half of America is say, is celebrating what they think is the greatest piece of progress in yeah. their lifetimes today. And yeah. we're saying it's regressive. But anyway, you know, so anyway, that, that the, the vocabulary is always problematic. But what David Brooks pointed out was that there was a, a lack of equality around respect. Yes, it was a very and, crisis of respect. Was and a very the, good there was a big, phrase. big chunk of America. And there's a big, big chunk of Britain of people who just feel that they're the losers in this yes. equation. It's very simple. Yes. They feel we're on the shitty end of the stick. And you can define the stick as much as you like. But we know we've got hold of the shitty end. And we're going to take it and we're going to beat you with it. So to, to just to take the trans case, it's really interesting. I don't think I think trans people have been really poorly treated in this debate because progressives or whatever we want to call them yeah. have sort of taken up their cause 
and may decided on a set of rules you know there yeah. shall be inclusion you know yeah. male body people should be allowed to go in yeah. women's sport yeah right Ma- male body people should be allowed to go in male prisons you yeah. know you have to name your pronouns yeah um all of this stuff. It's so it's it's it, so fucking patronizing. Which, by the way, you know, huge numbers of trans people weren't asking oh. for, weren't seeking, and it has done immense damage to their cause. Yeah. And it has also done immense damage by as a sort of proxy, as a as a symbol. It's good grift, though. It's it, great grift if you're the, if you're a journalist with a blog. And by the and way, in America, a load of aggro. in America, that I mean, this is a very much a footnote, but there there's been some calculations about what the lifetime costs of uh gender reassignment surgery uh-huh. to which to put it kindly people are being you know accelerated as it were yeah it's about a million dollars yeah but let's let's stick to your point which is the 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 use of a group as a football yes. to kick around there are all sorts of elements in this i mean scolding and virtue signaling is very easy mm getting things done that matter and yeah. change people's lives is very hard. Yeah. And we've been talking a lot in recent pods about the word, we use the word, the word audacity. Yes. Right? Now, what we seem to be witnessing is the response to the populist wave has been that the left of center has sort of taken uh, refuge in a combination of technocracy and virtue signaling. And it is not really looking forward facing Mm. at the big, big issues, you know, climate change, generational change, technology, pandemic resilience, social Mm. care, population mobility. Now, I can hear the Labour Party, any any strategists listening, saying, yes, we are. Yes, we are. But not enough. Mm. Not I I think the, the key to it for me is that. There's been a lot of conversation about it, a lot yes. of discussion, a lot of philosophizing about it, a lot of understanding in a kind of uh, intellectual way. But you go down to the streets of Leeds or Sunderland or wherever you, any town that feels alienated by Westminster yes. and and look around you and ask, pick someone out from a bus stop and say, what could we do better? Yeah. They'll have a bloody list. They'll say, get me to my GP on time, fix the bloody roads, make the transport better, right. get the kids to uh, so that the, the schools aren't bursting. All of these real things uh, that aren't, haven't been addressed for a generation now. Right. While we've been... I mean, and, and the biggest bloody thing in this country is the, the amount of time... Never mind the trade deals we're missing out on, the opportunities, the freedom of movement. The biggest catastrophe of Brexit was the amount of time it yes, sucked, it, it out, sucked of our, out of the bandwidth, out of our lives, consumed you know? the bandwidth of. But you know, I was thinking about all this in 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 relation to the budget, um, because I think there's a, an odd uh, sort of chord that links the American experience to the budget, which was. The simple fact of the budget was that she was going to have to raise taxes. And I thought, instead of framing the budget as it was all the Tories' fault, you could you'd have a bit of that. You could say, right, we're going to have to raise taxes. And I have to tell you, we're going to have to keep doing it mm. because the 21st century starts now. Yeah. Right. And we're going to do the following five big things. And it won't be done in a term, but it might be done in two. And, you know, this is a new beginning. Yeah. Instead of, you know, it was all the Tories' fault. Yeah. And if you can, if you can come up, if you can't, don't like it, come up yeah. with something better. See, and that, by the way, is becoming a repetitive theme. It really is. I heard Wes Streeting saying, Wes Streeting, who I've got a lot of time for, but I heard him saying exactly the same line, which is, well, if you don't like what I'm doing, you tell me what I should be, you know, tell yeah. me. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. It's like a football manager saying, you know, we, we, we're getting beat 3-0 at half time, right? I'm, I'm going to, these are the subs I'm going to make. But if you don't, if we still lose, don't blame me because you should have told me what to do at half time. Well, no, you've you've got to take the responsibility that the people have given you, and you've got to come with a plan and a mission that everyone can say, okay, give it your best shot. And then even if you fail, you know, to channel Theodore Roosevelt yes. as the man in the arena, even if you fail, 
people will respect you for totally. it. What people will hold you in contempt for is if you do all of the tax raising, all of the hard stuff, but there's no sense of mission. There's no sense of aspiration and ambition. Because how can anyone really pin you down if we don't know what you're actually trying to achieve? So the moment in the campaign I thought was best was when Harris, immediately assuming the mantle of the candidate, said, we're going to turn the page. And I thought, well, that's a good line. Yeah. And I assumed that it would be followed by lots of stuff, yeah. right? Whereas, in fact, it was just a slogan. Yeah. And the American people did turn the page, but unfortunately, they turned the page they, they from turned, her. They chucked the whole bloody <laughs> Away from away. her and Biden and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. To Trump. And, and this I, is where, you know, to bring it back here, where we, you know, Britain now is in a, a fight because we're in an invidious position. Yes. You know, we are marginal we're marginal to the united states we're marginal to europe now we really are we are still consumed with this kind of working out what the hell we think we are in the future and we haven't got the leadership that's providing those answers no. so we have really got to keir starmer and his government have really got to start to work out what is on the other page what's on the next page what's on the next page and the question unanswered i'm afraid in my view is do they know yeah Listen, folks, we're going to – one th message. Come If you like um, – if you want to have this conversation with us, come and listen to us at the Phoenix in Cavendish Square on November the 25th. Oh, please, uh, yeah. For an evening with it's the two mates. Uh, you can get tickets. Uh, there's a link in the show notes. It's going to be a great night. We're going to talk about Trump. We're going to talk about Britain. How to deal with the darkness. And we're going to talk about journalism as well. We'll yeah. have some funny Plenty stories from, from our past. So, um, come and join us at the Phoenix in Cavendish Square on November the 25th for an evening with the two mats. We'll see you in a minute. Absolutely. Welcome back. It's been, uh, it's been an important week in many ways, but one of my favourite silver linings of this week was <laughs> you handing me your new book well, well or the book that you have written with your great friend who is your great friend well uh, i i was lucky enough to be asked by sir michael kane to interview him for a collection of conversations he's just published uh came out this week it's called don't look back you'll trip over Brilliant and it's life. his guide to life yeah. and i knew him because um i helped him edit a thriller he published last year his first thriller because he's resi he's retired from acting but he definitely hasn't retired he's he's um, all guns blazing on the writing and what happened was it was an interesting process because i gave him his favorite director is the, the great john houston and i found a collection of interviews with john houston and i gave michael this for christmas and he said um I haven't done a book of, of interviews. And so we got sort of thinking it would be a nice way to uh, sort of present his the lessons of his, you know, he's 91, he's made 150 yeah. films. Yeah. And it's uh, a great format. Uh, uh, you, it's, it, it's a fun format because yeah. he he's, you know, he's a great raconteur. He has a million anecdotes about all his friends, you know, Sean Connery, Sidney Poitier, uh, Quincy, the late Quincy Jones, who sadly yeah. died this week. Yeah. Um, you know uh, Roger Moore you name it he's you know he's he's known everyone in Hollywood Shelley McLean Cary Grant they're all in there mm. but what's interesting is that as the, the title of the book suggests it's very forward facing mm. he's very influenced by his grandchildren who talks about a lot very very positive about the future and the new generation and he's got it's interesting because he's he he's fascinated by what comes next you know he's yeah. he's got serious views on digital life and the problems you know you know that that presents he's very interesting on the difference between you know patriotism good nationalism bad mm. um he's you know he, he he you know he talks about and you know he discovers he's got the, the michael Caine emoji where did that come from you know he talks <laughs> yeah. about uh, recording the michael Caine song with madness and yeah. you know he's he's there's a there's a massive extraordinary optimism and forward-facing dimension to him and it is full of these lessons that he has drawn from this extraordinary career um the, the, my favorite line in in uh, by way of life lessons yes is and it's so pertinent to i mean it couldn't be more relevant 
to this situation is is use the difficulty. Yeah, that's that's one of his sort of personal mantras. Really, what does he mean by that? Well, in order to survive and, and prosper for as long as he has in a cruel business like show business you have to be willing to deal with rejection and failure you know and he's the first to admit that not every single one I mean, you won two oscars um and you know is, is universally uh, revered in his profession but he's the first to admit and he says in in, in the book you know that he made some clunkers yeah and he's very good on what do you do after you've been rejected and and not just in the movie business but in anything and his philosophy is really look at what's happened and find because his view is it'll always be in there something that will enable you to benefit from learn from advance forward from the difficulty you've just experienced yeah and it's a tremendous philosophy because a it's it's all about resilience and he's very much against and he says this in the book the sort of scorecard approach to life that kids are forced through in education now where it's sort of implied to them that if they you know if they get a b in anything they're finished yeah silly yeah. silliness absolutely you know. rubbish yeah. um you know or if they don't go to university they they're not going to get a job yeah. silliness yeah. you know um his view is uh, that the success takes many forms and no one lives a, a, a life of perfect success. Yeah. The point is to keep you one foot moving in front of another, which yeah. sounds, I, I probably haven't done it justice, but, but but it's actually quite a profound view of how to, you know, prosper in, in the world. The, yeah. Uh, the thing I got from... In every sphere. I mean, I've, I've read half of it now in in one session, really. And it's it's not a short book. It's It's jam-packed full of amazing anecdotes but also oh, he's full of anecdotes but this it's what's great is my, he's the same age as my dad yeah my dad's 91 and what's brilliant about reading the book but also speaking to my dad now at that age is there's an there's an amps an absence of all the little stuff that consumes your yes life all the little troubles and traumas and all of that a bigger picture clearly emerges, you know, and it's an there's an absence of fear, I think, or yes. or certainly a, a sense that fear is the thing that holds us back as people, yeah. and that the more you can think of yourself as somebody with agency and with the yeah. right to be yourself, is the the better your life and, becomes, and you know, to expect setbacks, yeah, and not that's and not, life. But I, I do. Th I mean, I think that is actually. I mean, it, it, that is now a countercultural thing to say. Yeah. Because everything is geared to uh, perfect appearance, perfect um, career patterns, perfect everything. Yeah. And that's just not how life goes. Yeah. And, the, and, and the thing that I think has become acute is this sense of I, I should not be offended. Yeah. Nobody. I should never feel offended by somebody because offense is it's not a valid thing you know no. it's, it's there's something wrong when i'm offended that's not the case you should be offended all the time i mean that's the if you live in a pluralist society you're going to be offended well, by all the time by definition if you've got a view of something somebody else is going to have a different if view they're bound to and they're not it. going to necessarily in, like in, it but in, and, and this i think is where politics has steered us this this sense of modern politics where uh, in the first half we're talking about identity groups and you know, all of that politics around identity has led to a sense of a desire or a belief that there should be an equality of, of that everything is equal. And the truth yeah. is life is all about inequality and the, and the wrinkles on the tablecloth is, yes. what, is what life is about. Well, I asked him about what, you know, I, I described as political correctness, but others would call wokery and he said look you know i'm often asked this and you know I, I i haven't changed my view i believe in decency i believe in treating people with courtesy i believe in live and let live sounds good to me you yeah. know um and i i think that you know in that there's there's a great wisdom about how 
we can coexist. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's certainly not a politician, but it was very interesting. During the August riots, he um, he tweeted two. He doesn't tweet very often, but he tweeted two words, which was just calm down. Yeah, yeah, great. And it was millions of people yeah. viewed it, and it was picked up by the press. Well, that's brought that's brought us full circle to and Joe I, Biden. I don't know what his uh, his views are on the election. I haven't yeah. spoken to him about it, but 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 I'm I'm sure. Uh, I don't know, you know, it's not for me to speak for him, really, but but um, I'm sure his his first thoughts would be calm yeah, down. Calm down. Great, great words to end with. Um, do subscribe to the New European if Absolutely. you like this podcast. Um, I don't think there's, uh, you know, if you put your money where your mouth is, now is the time. Um, go to the New European forward slash two mats. Um, send in any feedback, any questions to two mats at tnepublishing.com uh, thanks as ever to our producers at Rethink Audio and until Sunday it's goodbye from me it's goodbye from him goodbye, goodbye.